Back in 2008, Rishon was working as a deep sea diver on the ONGC oil rig off the coast of Mumbai, India. At the time, he was 28, having been in the business for a good seven years. The ONGC rig was situated approximately 100 nautical miles from the coast, surrounded by the boundless Arabian Sea. The underwater world was a routine backdrop for many divers like Rishon, who spent hours fixing and mending the rig and structures. One evening in mid-August, he was on a routine maintenance dive with another co-worker, Arjun. They were there to fix a certain leak on a pipe section about 100 feet underwater. It was already dusk by the time they had submerged. The underwater tubing lights installed along the structure provided a faint, gloomy visibility that let them do their job. On that day, the usual stillness was broken by an odd echoing metallic noise. It resembled the sound of an underwater vehicle propeller, but it was a lot fainter, something like a fish flapping its fins quickly in the water. With all the technology they had, they were used to identifying underwater noises, but this was new. Rishan was facing the rig structure, while Arjun was actually positioned towards the open sea, and from the corner of his eye, he could see that he had his attention locked towards something in the open water. So he turns around and he sees a vague silhouette in the faint tube light illumination, approximately 50 feet away from them. It was large, whatever it was, about 12 feet from head to tail from what he could make, unlike any fish or sea creature he had seen before. He describes it having a long streamlined body, similar to that of a shark, but this creature bore two long front flippers. It appeared to have a body covering that looked more like fur than scales. Think similar to an otter, but not quite. In the dim lighting, it was really hard to make out any more details, but there was one thing they couldn't shake off. It looked like it was crawling forward in an odd manner, kind of pulling itself forward with its flippers, then extending its hind body forward in a single fluid motion, much like a seal on land. Rishan got on the radio and reported what they were seeing. There was some initial disbelief followed by an excited chatter, but with no available surface crew to investigate, they were asked to stay close to the rig and do their jobs. Now at this point, both men were a little put off by the unknown animal, but they had to continue to do their work. Whatever this thing was seemed to have noticed the beams emanating from their flashlights, and that's when it gradually started shifting in their direction slowly and very methodically. Both men attempted to stay calm, reassuring each other that it was probably just very curious and meant no harm, and that reasoning worked until this thing came within about 20 feet of both the men. Now at this point, because of the illumination, they can now see it much more clearly. They could also see that the lack of visibility had hidden its size and it was much larger than they had initially anticipated. It had huge round eyes and what appeared to be a kind of snout. If this was a some sort of sea otter, it was the strangest and largest one they'd ever seen in their lives. It seemed more curious than anything else and showed no signs of aggression or hostility. After a few moments of swimming around and investigating the two men, it appeared to grow bored and turned and disappeared downward. Rishon had never heard of otters, assuming that's what it was because that's what it resembled getting that large. If he had to estimate, now after seeing it only about 20 feet away, it had to have easily been over 20 feet in length. And there were also stories that had been shared with him from other divers over the years who've worked on the same rig that they had also seen strange things in the water that they simply could not explain. He did not go into great detail, but another diver he had worked with a few years prior had seen something like a very large shark closer to 200 feet down while working on the rig. It terrified this diver so much that he almost got decompression sickness because he ascended far too quickly out of fear. He described it being jet black and being the largest shark he's ever seen. Apparently this thing got curious and actually tried to nudge him and got very close to him, luckily deciding it wasn't going to eat him. He estimates that it was easily 50 to 60 feet in length and that it was drawn to the bright lights where he was working. He did not elaborate further. In August of 1991, near the Cape Aya, Crimean Peninsula, Ukraine, a unique incident took place as recorded by a diver in the Black Sea. 
He was swimming approximately 100 meters from the coast during a peaceful night under a full moon. Abruptly, he felt something nudging his shoulder, and as he spun back to examine the cause, he found nothing but turbulent water. Initially, he assumed his comrades were playing pranks on him, so he decided to head back to the coast, dismissing the occurrence. Yet as he swam, he felt another more forceful hit on his shoulder. Shockingly, this time when he looks back, he sees the face emerging from the water, a woman's face. The stunning detail was her eyes. Unlike any humans, they were incredibly large. Adding to the eeriness of the situation was the glow she appeared to emit, a phenomenon known as bioluminescence. In immediate response to his fear, the witness rushed towards the shoreline, exerting as much energy as possible. Behind him, he could hear something violently stirring in the water. He did not dare look back. Scared by the potential side of this thing that was causing the commotion, just when he thought he was safe, reaching the shallows, he felt a forceful punch to his shoulder. He turned around to see the swimming woman with black eyes showing a look of disagreement. Racing out of the water, he glanced back to see the glowing form of the woman who disappeared as she dove back into the dark water. The incident was over, but it left a profound, lasting impact on this witness. He couldn't get the image of the woman out of his mind, even finding her in his dreams. Now, this obsession led him back to the scene numerous times, hoping to see her again. However, she was never there. Despite the dread and curiosity he was left with, his experience was singular, and the mysterious woman had seemed to vanish into the deep waters forever. In the summer of 2002, near Odessa, Ukraine, a rather strange incident was reported from the Black Sea. According to the report, three Ukrainian deep sea divers set off to explore a strange crater-like depression they had found beforehand on the seabed. As they neared the area, they spotted an odd cube-shaped structure on the sea floor. Covered in seaweed and shellfish, it stood out in the underwater terrain. The curious divers made their way towards it with an intention to remove some cockle shells that were stuck to it. However, as they're set about prying the shells loose, an eerie, powerful voice echoed through the waters around them. The booming voice reverberated repeatedly with a stern warning. Don't do that, don't do that. This strange audio phenomenon happened over and over again, creating a very ominous atmosphere. The source or origin of the resonating voice remains unknown. After hearing the strange voice, the surroundings transformed instantaneously. What they saw then were ancient ruins that resembled classical Greek structures below. Also present were two odd-looking humanoid entities, each approximately two and a half meters tall. They were bizarrely submerged in the water without any visible diving gear or breathing apparatus. Their clothing consisted of tight body suits and they seemed to be examining the ruins with a disc-shaped device. The divers decided they had seen enough and began heading back to the surface. When they emerged, they noticed that the usually calm waters were now turbulent. Below them, they could see eerie pulsating green lights illuminating from the depths below. Now in 1982, there was another unusual incident reported at Lake Baikal in Russia. During a training exercise, Navy divers claimed they came across unusual human-like creatures swimming at a depth of approximately 164 feet. The giant beings were said to be about 10 feet tall. They appeared to be wearing silver suits that fit tightly around their bodies, along with round helmets on their heads. The divers attempted to actually chase after the creatures with hope of capturing one. However, these things put up a resistance. A violent unknown force that emanated from these things reportedly pushed back the divers upward, causing three of them to lose their lives and seriously injuring four others. This unexplained force created severe decompression injuries due to the rapid change in depth. Reports tell of giant underwater humanoids allegedly spotted in Russian lakes, not just a singular incident but reported across various remote waters during that same time. Now that same year saw a reconnaissance divers training exercise at Isaac Cole Lake, situated in the Transalisk Alato area. This lake, known for its chilly deep waters, served as the backdrop for these extraordinary claims. Allegedly, General V. Demyanko, who headed the military diver service of the engineer forces of the Ministry of Defense in USSR, had issued a warning about the previous encounters at Baikal 
cycle. These encounters detailed the sightings and experiences with these massive underwater creatures, sparking interest and unease amongst those in the field. Now, in 1996, a man named Burl Vikov reported a unique encounter while diving in the Black Sea, specifically in the Anapa area. He was hunting sharks and was about eight meters deep in the water when he sighted a group of large humanoids. The creatures, measuring around three meters each, were rising from the depths below. Borokov described them as having a milky white complexion and sharing physical similarities with humans, including human-like faces. However, their fish-like tails stood out. One creature from the group actually spotted Borovikov and even paused to look at him with its large frog-like eyes. Another creature from the group was seen waving a webbed hand as it swam past him. The entire group of these mysterious underwater humanoids approached Borovikov getting uncomfortably close before they suddenly swam away, disappearing into the ocean depths. These instances and others like them have been documented in the book Russia's USO Secrets, Unidentified Submersible Objects in Russian and in International Waters, written by the ufologist Paul Stonehill and Philip Mantle. In 1997, a strange occurrence struck Russian submariner and diver Nikolay M in the St. Petersburg region's Bay of Finland. Nikolay was diving in the shallow waters when he came across a cucumber-shaped elongated object at the bottom. He initially thought it was remnants from a wreckage site. He attempted to raise the object to the surface using some old rope, but he found that it would not move. Unfazed, he resolved to drag the large object out of his car parked on the nearby shore. To do this, he fetched a pneumatic drill to bore holes in the object as a means to attach a sling to it. However, upon drilling into it, a thick oil-like substance started to leak into the water. Despite this unusual occurrence, he persevered and continued to drill deeper until it hit something solid inside the object. The drilling caused the object to crack open, revealing a bubble. And inside the bubble was a humanoid creature with a shiny white skin color and a bleeding hole that was visible where the drill had seemingly made contact. In a distressing encounter, the creature didn't appear happy and stared menacingly at the diver. Immediately, it lashed its clawed hands on his arm cutting him deeply. Nicolay reported using his drill to retaliate, causing this thing to release him, but he would later faint. When he came around, he was being pulled out of the water by his rescuers. Now, post-rescue, the wounds on his arm were deep cuts, and he had lost a portion of his hand. Curiously, there was no sight of the weird cucumber-like entity or the bizarre creature that had attacked him. What had this man witnessed? Could it have been some sort of cocoon? But what type of creature did it contain? Well, ladies and gentlemen, the questions remain unanswered. In 1944, during the height of World War II, a significant naval and air offensive known as Operation Hailstone took place at Truck Lagoon. Orchestrated by the U.S., the objective was to dislodge the Japanese forces who were using the lagoon as a strategic naval base and supply stop. This immense attack, conducted over the course of two days from February 17th to February 18th, resulted in the sinking of approximately approximately 60 ships in the lagoon. These included both naval and merchant vessels, along with hundreds of airplanes. This event marked the creation of one of the world's largest underwater resting places. The attack inflicted a heavy toll with an estimated 3,000 casualties recorded. As a result, the bottom of the lagoon is now crowded with the wreckage of ships, tanks, and aircraft. Given the massive loss of life and the abundance of decaying maritime and aviation machinery, it it's unsurprising that stories of haunting and paranormal activities often lurk and surround the lagoon. Divers visiting the site report experiencing strange phenomena. Eerie sounds of voices calling out and apparitions roaming in the water. The most bizarre sighting, perhaps, is that of a sunken Japanese vessel, the Hokimaru, filled with a cargo of trucks when it submerged. Those who dived near it reported hearing unnatural noises, things like moving machinery, mechanical trucks, revving of engines, and in the same manner, other sunken ships seem to emit the noise of grinding machinery from now defunct engine rooms, and curious sounds resembling working machinery or human voices resonating underwater. Moreover, there are apparitions of individuals who should not be there. This underwater graveyard has been the subject of investigation by a team from the TV program Death.
destination truth, and the team claimed to have recorded what appeared to be the noise of a truck engine starting up from many years ago, and an underwater voice shouting out. Strangely enough, they even detected the heat signatures of a human shape dwelling among the ruins of the sunken ships, despite there being no one else present at the site. Truck Lagoon's underwater graveyard isn't the sole case of haunted shipwrecks. Another example is the 19th century wreckage of the British mail ship RMS Roan. In October of 1867, it sank near Salt Island in a hurricane located in the British Virgin Islands. It's common for divers exploring the wreckage to report sightings of eerie things. They apparently rushed from the wreckage towards the surface, disappearing halfway through. Another notable haunting dates back to the 1940s, the USAT Liberty. A U.S. cargo ship was torpedoed by the Japanese in 1942. Tales surrounding the wreck include a phantom torpedo, and as the story goes, this ghostly object charges at divers only to vanish just as it's about to reach them. Now, what I find very interesting is the speculation of all these kinds of encounters and the fact that it's happening to all these divers everywhere, and some divers apparently are not making it back to the surface. In fact, speaking of divers not making it back to the surface, let's look at one of the most famous missing diving cases, Ben McDaniel. In 2010, a year full of devastating trials and tribulations, Ben's life was in shambles. His marriage had ended in a very nasty divorce, taking its toll on him psychologically, emotionally. The construction venture he'd founded and viewed as a vessel for his aspirations had collapsed financially, burning him with a whopping tax debt, summing to around 50 grand. To add insult to injury, the specter of his younger brother, Paul's untimely demise at the tender age of 22 from a stroke lingered on in his life. Paul had shockingly passed away in 2008, right in front of Ben's eyes, leaving him in a bout of sorrow and severe depression. Eager for a clean slate and desperate to escape the ghost of his past, Ben made the choice to relocate. He opted to move to Florida and dwell in his parents' charming residence at Santa Rosa Beach on the Emerald Coast. He hoped that this might serve as a new beginning pushing him away from the despair that he had been hunted by. Ben and Florida began to truly unwind in his fresh surroundings. His family and girlfriend noticed a considerable change in his attitude towards life. They said he appeared happier and more hopeful than he had in years. The drastic change of environment also gave him the chance to start up a past interest, a new hobby, scuba diving, something he dipped in and out since he was young, but now he got a hold of some equipment and started to be a regular visitor to a place called Vortex Springs, a popular spot renowned for its freshwater spring and complex network of underwater caves. He was scuba diving here more often than not. Now, Vortex Springs, extremely dangerous and mysterious, and it is not suitable for beginners or the light heart. The beginning dive takes you down nearly 60 feet, introducing you to a massive cavern. It's from 115 feet onwards though, where the real excitement begins. The cave, narrow, deep, and wandering for about 300 feet deep into the water, only opens up to the most expert of divers who have been entrusted with the key, past a gate fixed at the ending point of the cave. Taking a dive into the cave is fraught with risks, ominously warned by a grim reaper sign placed at the entrance. Behind the ominous gate lies a complicated tapestry of chambers and tunnels. These extensive networks have been charted to more than 1,600 feet in length, snacking through pitch black surroundings, sinking to depths nearly 310 feet below the surface. However, much of this intricate web remains untouched and unexplored. The inability to see, along with the disorienting twists and the sometimes extremely tight passageways, requires these specialized divers to remove their tanks to maneuver in some places. Considering this, it isn't surprising that this has been the fatal last dive site for several experienced divers over the years. Vortex Springs has earned descriptions such as perilous, dangerous, and harrowing thanks to the thrilling and risky experience it offers. On a searingly hot day in August, August 18th, 2010 to be exact, Ben followed his usual routine and went to the Vortex Springs. During the middle of the day, 
Others noticed him thoroughly checking out the cave entrance. He then came back up, had his tanks filled at the dive shop before spending the rest of the day with his dive log and equipment. He meticulously jotted down notes and repeatedly tested his gear. As the evening came around, he wrapped up his day by placing a call to his family. After the conversation, he prepared for his second dive of the day, starting at 7.30 p.m. And as he descended into the water, the sun was dipping below, gradually darkening the entire area the two divers, Chuck Cronin and Eduardo Turan, who also worked in the dive shop, had spotted Ben. From the gear he donned, a helmet and lights, they could tell he was geared up for a cave diving expedition. Now, they knew Ben quite well. He was a regular at the diving site and considered quite adept in his abilities. In the past, Ben was believed to have tried to force the gate open. Despite breaching diving rules and Ben lacking the necessary qualifications, Taran decided to unbolt the gate for him on this particular occasion. Really stupid move, really. Unknown to them at the time, this would be the last sighting of Ben McDaniels. Little did they know that this act of bending the rules would be associated with a cloud of mystery surrounding Ben's disappearance. The following morning, Ben's truck was still in the dive shop parking lot where he'd left it the previous day. It went unnoticed amid the summer crowd. It was only until the truck remained in the same spot the day after the employees of the dive shop sensed something out of the ordinary. They quickly notified the authorities, who responded by securing the dive site for investigation. The examination of the site revealed no traces of Ben's diving gear. However, the search of his truck resulted in finding his wallet containing $700 in cash, his cell phone, and a dive log. The log documented various cave dives he'd partaken in and also had a cave map he'd created. Notably, there was no evidence of any struggle or disturbances in the truck. When authorities inspected the beach house, house where Ben resided, they discovered his dog was unfed and the house was entirely untouched. From these observations, the authorities were led to believe that Ben had likely become trapped while exploring the cave system, ultimately leading to his presumed demise by drowning. His truck's persistent presence and his dog's neglect pointed firmly towards this conclusion. Following the mysterious disappearance of Ben McDaniel, a host of experienced divers gathered at the site to help in search efforts. They meticulously searched the entire cave cave, including every tunnel, crack, and crevice where they thought Ben might have gone. But despite their extensive efforts, they found no sign of him. Ed Sorensen, a professional cave diver and recovery expert, traveled to the site to contribute to the search effort. He made three incredibly risky dives, going even further than what Ben had charted an estimated 1,700 feet into the pitch dark cave. Sorensen used smaller sized tanks to fit into harder reach places, hoping to find any trace of Ben. But even after his exhaustive search, he found nothing. There was no sign of the body, not even the slightest disturbance of the sediment that might suggest the presence of a body. Moreover, there was no evidence of an intensified scavenger activity, which might indicate a dead body. It appeared as if Ben McDaniel had vanished entirely as though he swam away into the nothingness. Despite the comprehensive search, the only signs were a pair of discarded oxygen tanks near the cave's entrance. This unusual clue raised more questions than answers, deepening the mystery surrounding the case. It's not common practice for cave divers to leave their extra tanks at the cave's front. They usually drop them off at different points along the route for emergencies or to assist with their exit. Upon inspection of the left behind tanks, it was discovered that they contained pure oxygen, not the expected mix of oxygen and gas. This was another puzzling piece of the puzzle given that Ben McDaniel was a pretty experienced diver, even though he didn't have a formal certification of cave diving. Ample research beforehand is assumed. Adding up to the enigma, Ben was not a small man. He was 6'1 and weighed roughly 210 pounds. With his size, along with his usual diving gear, it seemed improbable that he'd even be able to squeeze himself into spots in the cave that others couldn't reach, especially considering that he didn't have the specialized training. These factors make the case more perplexing. Many experienced divers meticulously would search the cave for 36 days. As the search went on, many began to wonder if Ben was not in the water to begin with, or if he had managed to 
leave the water. Various theories started to circulate about what could have happened. Some suspected that Ben had been murdered. They suggested that somebody might have drowned him intentionally before retrieving his body and disposing of it on land. However, this theory was put into question as despite the thorough use of the sniffer dogs in the surrounding area, no trace of a body was ever found. Another theory proposed that Ben's body might have drifted with the water's current. It's presumed that it could have floated from Vortex Springs' outlet into Blue Creek and Sandy Creek, and finally, the nearby river. Extensive searches along these water courses yielded no signs of Ben. Additionally, extensive water testing for increased bacterial activity, a potential indicator of a decaying body, showed no alarming signs. Yet another theory suggests that Ben faked his own death to escape outstanding debt. I mean, it wouldn't be the last time people did this. However, this hypothesis lacked solid evidence. As a matter of fact, later investigations showed that Ben had settled all of his debts before his mysterious disappearance. His family strongly denied this particular theory. They claimed that Ben would have never abandoned his cherished pet dog intentionally or put his family and girlfriend through such an ordeal. In the aftermath of his disappearance, the family of Ben have grown more certain that he met a sinister end. They even enlisted a PI who entertained the theory that his body was moved from the underwater cave before the authorities were ever alerted. Alternatively, he may have been murdered on land with the diving narrative only serving to obscure the truth. Another scenario could be that Bend was found dead by the staff of the dive shop who removed his body to evade legal charges. Ben's family raises questions about Eduardo Taran, the last person known to have seen Ben alive, who was dismissed as a suspect quickly after passing a simple lie detector test. They also also cast suspicion on the demise of the Vortex Springs owner, Lowell Kelly, who was already shrouded in notoriety. In 2011, Lowell was put on probation for seven years after an episode where he brutally assaulted an employee who owed him money. Later, Lowell lost his life in a strange incident where he fell down a staircase and slipped into a coma due to a head injury. Law enforcement has remained tight-lipped about the circumstances of his death, refusing to divulge any additional details or autopsy results. Ben's family contends that Lowell's death was not accidental, but rather tied up with Ben's vanishing. Now, there are several questionable details in the case, but notably, many individuals linked to the case have a criminal background. Furthermore, it's unusual that it took two days for anyone at the dive shop to notice Ben's truck hadn't moved from the parking lot. The last two people to see Ben, Taryn, and Cronin are strongly believed to hold additional information about his disappearance. However, what that information might be remains unknown. As of now, the disappearance of Ben McDaniel remains a mystery without resolution. What do you guys think happened to Ben? Was he eaten alive? perhaps a victim of the same creatures that many Eastern European divers reported seeing, or did he simply choose to vanish without a trace, maybe living a new life, or did something sinister happen to him? You decide. I'm currently serving as a military diver in the US Navy. The current year is 2014, and during most weekends this past summer, our unit was stationed at Pearl Harbor, Hawaii, which is a stunning place, although we might as well have been in the middle of nowhere. The nearest mainland is thousands of miles away, separated by the vast Pacific Ocean. Our quarters consisted of two decommissioned submarine bases. One was our main quarters, and the other was our training bay, where we spent nights conducting diving operations. Seeing that summer nights are usually a haven for some r and &R, our CO would set up evening recreational activities for us. This particular night, it was a rendezvous with the Navy SEALs unit for a friendly game of football, which had me and a few on maintenance duty for the diving equipment. So the duty was simple, clean up the diving bay, do an inventory of the equipment, and take a couple of deep dives to inspect the old naval wrecks down below. But things did not go as planned. While diving in the evening with my buddy, I felt an unsettling change in the underwater currents. This wasn't unusual, but that night, the shifts were alarmingly swift and aggressive. There were also moments when we heard our sonar releasing unusual frequencies, as if there's a large colony of dolphins or similar aquatic creatures nearby. At one point, we stumbled upon an underwater cavern, a location unbeknownst to us despite practicing numerous dives in the same ocean floor. And this is where it gets intense. As we watched the entrance of the cave, a figure emerged from it. In the diffused light, we could make out it was a fellow human, a diver maybe, but he was not wearing anything except a tight silver diving suit. We were completely baffled. The water was far too cold to survive without a thermal protective suit. Yet here was this man floating unfazed. He 
noticed us and then went to look up at us. We noticed something was wrong with him instantly. He had large, bulging black eyes. His body began to contort oddly and started making awkward movements as if trying to approach us. He moved very robotically. It felt like being in a scene of a horror movie. However, the relentless current kept pushing him back. My diving partner and I decided to abort the dive and returned to our submarine ASAP. Feeling like I wanted to crawl out of my skin, we ascended. As we climbed back into our submarine, I had the distinct feeling of being watched. It felt as if those underwater eyes were still fixed on us, observing our every move. I felt sick to my stomach, like my whole world had been turned upside down, but I wrote it off as fatigue. We returned to our quarters unscathed. It was just getting dark, and we were giving the final touches to our maintenance work when suddenly, the hatch of our submarine quarters flung wide open with a massive thud. It seemed as if someone or something had come bursting in, only to find there was absolutely nothing. While trying to make sense of what had just happened, we could hear scratching and thumping sounds coming from below the submarine. It was strange. One of my buddies convinced me we had a few rats living down in the submarine, and that's what we were hearing. I just couldn't believe him, not after my experience. Make of my story what you will. Now that you've made it this far, I want you all to comment down below, I'm never swimming again. So I know you made it to the end of the video. Like and subscribe if you guys enjoyed this episode. As always, I love you all. Keep an open mind, and I'll catch you all in the very next episode.